Um, I'm going to I'm going to mute you and uh, we are going to uh, and we're going to begin uh, the only announcement which I'm committed to doing and uh, if you're if you're OK, uh, is uh, the mission study surveys. If you have not turned yours in, please do so. You can bring it to church on Sunday. You can post it in the mail. If you've got a well-trained pigeon, you can have it delivered. Uh, but uh, do your part. So that's my commercial, and now I'm going to mute you. Uh, as soon as I remember how, there we go. And then let's uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you for bringing us together, for keeping us connected, for giving us opportunities to to listen and to read and reflect and to learn about your words. Uh, we pray that as we dive into this passage tonight, that you would uh, teach us something new about what it means to be a follower of your son. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So welcome, everybody. If uh, you were here last week, you heard the preamble that uh, Jen and I are co-teaching this class as a, as a way to look at uh, six Six passages that are that are difficult for one reason or another. Either they say something confusing, or they call us to something that is not comfortable. Um, and uh, but but a passage that people can wrestle with and um, and, and learn from. And so uh, this uh, little text that we have tonight is full of statements that are hard to. Um, hard to grasp or hard to figure out how to live. Um, and so uh, our practice uh, for, for Jen and for me is um, I'm going to give some background, talk a little bit about the, the technical parts of the text and how they fit into the, the story of Jesus and the story that Mark uh, tonight tells about Jesus. And then um, Jen's got some reflections on what that means for us and how, um, you know, the question is always, how then shall we live? And uh, Jen's got Jen's got all the answers on that one tonight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so the passage tonight is from the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel. Uh, I'll read it in a little bit, but it starts at verse 34 and it goes into the very first verse of the next chapter. That's uh, that in itself gives me an opportunity to talk just a little bit about the apparatus that we use, the chapter and verses that we use for the Bible. Those weren't in there originally. The Bible writers didn't add those. Uh, those were added, uh, those are added later. Um, some say as part of a printing regimen, but also um, maybe as a, as a guide to reading. But every once in a while, the breaks in chapters break up something that was probably a, an original paragraph. And that's what we have tonight. Clearly, the the line of reasoning that Mark is following in our text tonight spills over into the first verse of what would become later the next chapter. So that's a freebie. That's not even written down here. That's just, you know, something we can know. If for, like I always say, for Jeopardy, if there's a Bible category someday, you all should ace it. That's my goal. So uh, I want to give some background to this passage and about uh, the Gospel of Mark. One of the things I always say about the Gospel of Mark is that it's written in a fairly different style to the other three Gospels, even to the other two Gospels that resemble it, uh, Matthew and Luke. Mark starts his story with Jesus already preaching in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. He's already out there proclaiming the Gospel. And uh, he doesn't take a breath until the end. And in the course of that, the word, uh, I know every preacher you've ever had has used this uh, line, but the word immediately shows up about 44 times in the gospel of Mark. It is breathless from beginning to end. It is a fast paced, uh, important story told to a group of people in crisis. And I think that's uh, that's part of what I want to get to tonight. This um, uh, the Gospel of Mark was written somewhere in between, uh, uh, maybe right around the year seventy A.D. And for those of you who have a little smattering of history to you, that's a very important year 
and we're going to talk about that. It's written during what's called now the First Jewish-Roman War. This was a revolt of uh, Jewish citizen, citizens in Judea and, uh, and in Samaria, which is the region north of it, uh, against their Roman occupiers. And it was, um, uh, oddly enough, and, and for those of us who, who are American by temperament, uh, the first Jewish-Roman war started as an anti-tax revolt, like a Proposition 13 on steroids. And it, it, it was a violent revolt. It was a, uh, a, a small-scale guerrilla war when it started, but Rome being Rome, they sent uh, legions into the region to try and um, put this revolt down. Uh, Jewish soldiers, Jewish troops won some of the early battles, including one that killed 600, I'm sorry, 6,000 Romans in one battle. And uh, you have to imagine that that, that in, uh, caused, the, caused Rome to send even larger armies and for them to be even more ruthless in the way that they prosecuted that battle. Um, Ironically, during the first Jewish-Roman War, the Jews went to war against each other, too. <laughs> and so in the midst of a war with Rome, uh, two, maybe more, but two large factions of the Jewish side went to war against each other. Uh, largely, it was the group of Sadducees who were in Jerusalem, the people who followed the Sadducees that we see in the New Testament sometimes, and then the other group is a more familiar name. They were the Zealots. The Zealots were from, the, from the, the, the part of Israel that was north of Jerusalem, really from Galilee and from other regions that sound uh, familiar to us. So they went to war against each other. At one point, they both occupied the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which was under siege by the Romans, but the Jews were fighting themselves. So uh, nobody, nobody's really got a corner on infighting. It's been a part of the life of communities of faith for a long time. And uh, this battle is, is no different. As Rome took control of the region and primarily Jerusalem, which was a massive, had a wall around it that was meant to protect it from invaders, um, they started to inflict heavy punishments. And for those of us who are 20th century people, the nearest uh, analogy we would have is the way that um, Nazi Germany behaved toward people or cities that resisted their power. So, for example, in 1942, the, a man called the Hangman of Prague, who was Hitler's right-hand man in Czechoslovakia, was assassinated by partisans. The, the Nazis went in and shot uh, maybe a thousand civilians in reprisal for that. Rome was like that. And the, the punishment of choice for Rome against anyone who uh, tried to rebel against it was crucifixion. We think of crucifixion as a singular event with Jesus, um, but uh, there were thousands of crucifixions in the Roman Empire during this period. There were as many as 500 a day in Jerusalem. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, Jerusalem's not that big. Uh, at one point, one writer talks about the entire old city being ringed with crosses with dying people on them. It was a brutal way to suppress dissent, and it was a peculiarly Roman way uh, to suppress dissent. And so crucifixions were commonplace, but they were known as shaming, horrible ways to die. In 70 AD, which is uh, getting toward the end of the war, by, the time, uh, by this time Rome had an upper hand, they destroyed the temple. This is called the second temple, the first temple being the one that Solomon built, the second temple built in the sixth century BC. Uh, it lasted all the way through. It was in disrepair when Herod became king. Herod restored the temple. 
uh, expanded what's called the Temple Mount, which is the big flat area in the, in, in the city center where the temple would sit. Now the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is there. Um, and, uh, but Rome came in and destroyed the whole thing as part of their punishment of the Jews for going to war against them. Uh, like 1776 or um, uh, what other important years do we have? 1621 uh, when the pilgrims, you know, there are all these years that we think of that are important. 70 AD is a crucial year in the history of Jewish and Christian faith. It's the year Rome destroyed the temple. This is the background uh, to the time of Jesus and also to um, uh, the writing of the gospels and the early letters that became part of our, uh, our Bible. Um, Mark is written to Christians in Rome, which makes this a nice pairing with, the, uh, with Paul's letter to the Romans last week. It's written to a church at the, at the home, at the center of Roman power, made up of Christian converts from Roman religions and Christian converts from Judaism. These are people who formed a community of faith while Rome and uh, the Jewish people in uh, Judea were at war with each other. And so Mark is writing this gospel to that audience, an audience in crisis, an audience fearing persecution, an audience that was split between people who had a side in the war that was happening down in Judea. And so um, the Jewish-Roman War was a crisis, and the focus of Mark's gospel is on the cost of discipleship, what it means to be a follower of Jesus during a time where all these things are happening. And, and so that's the backdrop for, uh, for our passage today. I want to read this passage for you and uh, listen for what... Uh, Listen for the word of God in this, and listen for a glimpse of what Christ is calling us to in this passage, starting in verse 34 of Mark chapter 8. Then he, that's Jesus, then he called the crowd to, the, to him along with his disciples, and he said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. And then he said to them, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. So that's our passage tonight. That's, that's, that's this uh, turning point in Mark's gospel where he, where Jesus um, you'll notice in that very first verse, calls the crowd to join him. He'd been teaching his disciples up to this point, and, and, uh, but he very clearly uh, calls to the crowd. This is a universal message. It's not just the 12 disciples who have to hear this message about taking up their cross and following Jesus. It's for everyone. And one writer that I, I read this afternoon said this about this particular passage. He said, Jesus is saying that there are those who wish to, that those who wish to follow him must be prepared to shift the center of gravity in their lives from a concern for self to reckless abandon to the will of God. I don't often envy sentences, but I kind of wish I'd written that one. Jesus is saying that those who wish to follow him must be prepared to shift the center of gravity in their lives from a concern for self to reckless abandon to the will of God. No to self and yes to God. Right there in the first 
uh, right there in the beginning of our text. And then note that, the, you know, he talks about bearing the cross, right? You've got you've to gotta take up your cross and deny, uh, and deny yourself. Bearing the cross would have been a horrible image for these people, all of whom would have seen more than one crucifixion in their lifetime, let alone having heard the story of Jesus, of Christ crucified and raised. They might have known people who had been crucified. They certainly would have seen a crucifixion. This was Rome's way of keeping order in the empire. And so uh, and and Rome had a Rome cared about order more than Presbyterians do. So they would have seen what the cross actually looked like, and that that whole drama of having to carry your own cross to your own execution. When Jesus looks at them and says, "You got to take up your cross," he's saying something that isn't meant to be pretty. It's meant to be uh, disarming and disorienting for the people who heard it. And so they would have seen as hundreds of people uh, crucified in Jerusalem per day, but maybe thousands daily across the empire. And then uh, verse 35, a life given is more valuable than a life protected for self selfish purposes. I think that's something uh, that's worth that's worth looking at. Verse thirty-five: um, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. A life given is more valuable than a life protected from risk and commitment. And so Jesus is saying, "Look, if your life, if if you really believe what I am saying and what I'm offering, then you've got to be willing to." Uh, offer your whole life, the living part, and maybe even the death of it, 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 as a follower of me. It's not about being frivolous with our lives. I think I think we can look at the whole witness of Scripture and recognize that life is precious. But it is about living fully for God, even if sometimes we have to suffer and die for it. And so. Going into verses uh, 30, one thing I want to point out in verse 35, because it comes again uh, a little bit later, Jesus says, whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And then later on, he says, if you're ashamed, ashamed of me and my words, of me and the gospel, uh, that, that's important. Jesus is acknowledging that it's about him as a person, but also the message that he shared. So you get to 36 and 37, and uh, Jesus turns to the language of commerce. He's, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet give up, the, let lose their soul? Uh, what can anyone give in exchange? What can you barter for their soul? There's all these commercial words that he uses, profit, gain, loss, and barter. And all of these are Jesus' way of teaching this in a way that people would have understood. And then this last part, uh, well, one of the last verses, verse 38, to be ashamed of Christ and his words um, is to affirm the idolatry of the world or the idolatries of the world. To be ashamed, to, to somehow say that no, Christ's good gospel, Christ's good news is not the filter through which we should see everything, is to say that the various other things on offer, the various other idolatries of the world are more valuable. So he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them. Now, that's a hard enough passage on its own, but then he gets to something that is difficult to make sense of, and that's um, uh, and that's verse uh, chapter nine, verse one. He says to them, uh, "Truly, I tell you." In some of our Bibles, it'll be, uh, "Verily, verily, I say unto you." Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death 
before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now, people have argued about what this means. Uh, on the one hand, and the simplest explanation is that not long after this passage, maybe even in Mark 9, uh, one of the central events of Jesus' ministry happens, the transfiguration. You know, he goes up to the hill, and, and suddenly he's shining in white light, and, and you see him with uh, Moses and Elijah standing next to him. And it's this key moment in Mark's telling of the gospel story, Mark's telling of Jesus' story. And so some people think that the, transfig the transfiguration is, um, is seeing the kingdom of God come with power during their own lifetime. On the other side, the, the far more skeptical side, people will say this is, this is Jesus predicting the second coming and failing, uh, that, it did, that it never happened. And so I have, a, I have a slightly different view. I, I think the right answer is that first one, that the transfiguration was Jesus saying the kingdom of God is coming with power. Um, but I think, I think this is about Pentecost. I think this is about some people who were standing there listening to him were going to live long enough or had lived long enough to see the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the formation of the church literally the kingdom of God coming in power. And so uh, the nice thing about having a, uh, a, a contradictory reading is that it works pretty well with, it, both of those could be true. What I'm not willing to say is that this is some example of the failure of Christ to return as he promised. Within uh, 40 days or so after Jesus leaves the earth, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Arguably, some of the people listening to Jesus as he gives this teaching in Mark 8 would have survived to see the coming of the Holy Spirit, see the coming of the kingdom of God in power. And so, just as I'm about to hand it off to Jen, that this whole thing is about how to be a follower in a world that is hostile to followers of Jesus. And I don't think we give this, this passage its due if we reduce that to just culture war nonsense. This is not about, oh, I'm persecuted because somebody said happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. This is the actual real life challenge that a world that gives us all kinds of idolatries to follow, um, it's the challenge of still trying to hold to the message, to the person and to the message of Jesus Christ. Remember twice, me and my gospel or me and my words, Jesus says. And so if you imagine a community in persecution, if you imagine a community that is completely helpless in the face of the prevailing uh, imperial power, and, and that they'd seen examples of that by the dozens or hundreds every day of crucifixions. To hear the, their Messiah, their deliverer say, you might have to take up your own cross at some point. And I expect you to do that if you have to. It's not an easy passage. Uh, none of us in our, uh, most of us, as I look around the screen, we're all here in the Central Coast. This is a pretty nice place to be. Uh, there's not a lot of cross picking up here, but part of being a faithful follower is entering into such a trusting relationship with God that we're willing to take up the cross in his name. So with that, we're going to shift for just a second. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll circle back. Jen and I will talk a little bit and then um, and then we'll go to some questions. Well, okay, now I'm not sure I got the assignment right. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I went back a little bit um, in Mark 8, just because that part to me is kind of fascinating with what happens in the actual scripture we had today. So I kind of went back to um, verse 27, and it helped me put things in context a little bit because I... Um, 
actually struggled more with the part about denying ourselves and picking up our cross and following. Um, so back a little bit, it feels like um, the disciples themselves might not have realized it at the time, but it feels like they were about to take a test that they weren't necessarily prepared for a test to see what they learned or not up to this point about who Jesus is and why he was there and what it means to follow him. Up until now, the point um, of Jesus' ministry and with the disciples had uh, taken place mostly in small boats and in cities and villages along the Sea of Galilee. And now their journey is about to point towards Jerusalem and it feels like things are about to get more serious. It's not just about Jesus's life anymore, but about his death and his resurrection. For the disciples to truly follow Jesus, it was going to require more of them than just words or actions. It was going to require their whole lives in the most humble and devoted way. The exchange that um, Jesus has uh, between him and the disciples, I find it kind of fascinating because we are starting to understand the messianic nature of Jesus as opposed to Jesus as just a teacher and a healer, but also because we do not know what exactly this means and who is supposed to know. Jesus wants us to know um, who people think that he is and also who his disciples think he is. And as Peter answers and tells Jesus that he believes he is the Messiah, um, instead of infirm, affirming Peter's response, Jesus sternly orders Peter and the other disciples not to tell anyone. And this is in opposition to what is asked of us today, because we do know who Jesus is and was and are to tell others. This is also not the first time Jesus tried to downplay the messianic nature of who he was. There was a mystery to what Jesus was doing. For whatever reason, Jesus was not quite ready to share with everybody. Then Jesus goes on to teach, as he always does, and tells the disciples what is going to happen next. Peter, despite telling Jesus earlier that he believed Jesus was the Messiah, rebuke Jesus. But then Peter gets in trouble and Jesus um, with Jesus and Jesus rebukes Peter. At this point, you have to kind of feel sorry for Peter. He's kind of like that kid in class who always thinks they have the right answer, but really missed the whole point. It feels like that was Peter in this scenario. I think Peter understood there was more to Jesus than just the guy who was in front of them and the mystery they were taking part in, but didn't actually know what that meant. And that's okay, I think, because we are all called to be lifelong learners and followers, but things are about to get real and Jesus still has some teaching to do. This is when Jesus takes a different approach. And as John said, instead of just speaking to the disciples, he calls a crowd to gather around him and begins to speak to them. Jesus says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In this moment, when we are still not quite sure what the messianic nature of Jesus means, Jesus gathers a crowd to speak to, and it feels like we get another piece of the messianic puzzle. It is important to notice here that Jesus calls a crowd. When Jesus says, if you want to become my followers, Jesus is inviting all to follow him. Christianity is not just for the chosen ones like the disciples. It is for all who seek the grace and redemption that Christ has to offer. In other words, you do not have to be chosen, but you have to choose to follow we do have a choice. Up until this point, Jesus and the disciples had been traveling and Jesus had been teaching them. But now Jesus is asking people to do more than learn. He is asking them to follow. It is no longer about simply speaking or thinking or doing. It's about following. 
It's about making a decision to deny yourself and to take up the cross and follow. That is what we are being asked to do today. It isn't just about professing we believe, we believe or speaking about what we believe or even acting in a certain way. It's about following Jesus. Jesus says we are to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow. I think this notion of following surpasses any understanding we might have of following. It's a big deal. Mark understood on a real level what it meant to take up his cross and follow. He knew it was not going to be easy. He knew it would be, he would be questioned, threatened, mocked, and that his life would be in danger. Today, we should not take for granted that we are free to worship and follow Jesus. The magnitude of what Jesus was and is asking us to do was not something they could easily comprehend at the time. Honestly, I'm not sure it's something we can truly comprehend today to pick up our cross and follow. We need to remember that there is an intentionality to following Jesus and that we need to take it seriously. Of course, it is different today than when Jesus first spoke these words or even when the gospel writer wrote these words. The church is not being persecuted per se, and we have the freedom to practice our faith openly. But I would say the stakes are just as high. The church is a vulnerable place right now. Many are questioning its relevance and its importance in their lives. Statistics are showing that a low percentage of people actually attend church. And I don't mean that because of COVID. It's up to us to change that statistic. And we are called to do our part to follow Jesus, to spread the gospel, and to proclaim its relevance. So what does it mean to follow Jesus today? I think it means believing in the hope of grace and resurrection, even when we are working through some of the darkest moments, believing in the power of God's healing love, even when we are grieving and in pain. It means actively coming to church, even on a screen, and actively soaking up opportunities to learn, serve, and grow. It means reading and praying and listening and talking and breaking bread and serving and learning and cultivating. It means not being ashamed to claim your identity as a Christian. Tell others that you attend church and invite them to join you. And just like John said, come and see. This is a perfect opportunity to invite people to come and see. This is something we can all do. Don't pass it off to the pastor or to the deacons or to the director of Christian ed. We can all follow Jesus. Remember in this passage, Jesus was not just talking to the disciples. Jesus gathered a crowd to hear his lesson. Because of that, we learn that discipleship is accessible to all of us. Like the disciples at this point, I don't want you to think you should, you are about to take a test that you're not prepared for. The messianic nature of Jesus is no longer a secret. It is time to tell others who Jesus is and what the church is capable of doing. We need to take the call to follow Jesus seriously, not only for the sake of our own faith, but for the sake of others. We should not be passive observers of God's work, but active participants in the work that needs to be done. We have to be willing to take up our cross, to let go, so that we can fully be who God is calling us to be and reach our capacity as Christians and extend even beyond that. Taking up your cross sounds dramatic, at least to me, and sometimes it feels like it's impossible to do. And it's also hard for us to let go and to follow. But it feels like there are two crosses waiting for each of us, the cross of the world and the cross of Christ. And we have to choose which one we're gonna take up and follow. The cross of the world has a lot of appeal, it can feel like a shortcut to happiness, happiness, and in the beginning, be easy to carry. 
but it becomes heavy and more disappointing as time passes. The cross of Christ, on the other hand, can be difficult and challenging at the start, but it does get easier if carried faithfully over the years. Eventually, the cross of Christ will bring us to a happiness without end. And that's what I think we are called as Christians to do, to faithfully deny ourselves. And it doesn't mean we have to give up on who we are or what we are called to do individually, but we need to do that with our eyes on Jesus and on the cross. So I still struggle with that, but I kind of think that's where we are. Thanks for that, Jen. I'm I'm struck by the idea of two crosses. Mm. That that's a that's a nice image for this passage. That yeah, I think um, Augustine talks about two cities, right? We're citizens of the city of God, and we're the city of humans, mm -hmm. and that that we're, we always live in that tension. But two crosses. That's a new one for me. That's uh that's good. Um, we've got about uh, not quite twenty minutes left and so we'll we'll probably pass it over and go to some questions but um i think uh yeah I, jen do you have anything else we could i think we could probably go to questions okay yeah that would be great and i apologize my dog is going crazy right now so if you hear that noise it's my dog <laughs> uh so i'm going to invite you to be unmuted Unless you have noise going on in the background, if Jeopardy's still on, you can keep yourself muted. <clears throat> um, who's got a question for us? As we... Now, do you need to go to the whole? Uh, yeah, take uh, questions. The little squares of people, or just the big one? Oh, yeah, yeah the square. There we go. Yeah. Uh, you know, it says glory on your screen, but I know that's uh, not you. Gonna raise over here. Yeah. Uh, question: Is this the same mark that Barnabas wanted to take on the second missionary journey? Yeah. And that, was, my, that mark kind of was a coward at one point. I don't either. Yeah. Uh, I I don't I don't think so. I think that's John Mark, and I don't know if that's the same person. For the most part, uh, there's no real attribution uh, to this story. Uh, to the author so it comes down to us as mark i don't know what uh, you did. somebody there's three things two thousand years ago knew who mark was yep. <laughs> uh, but i'm not sure we do uh, nowhere in the gospel that's not it, the right I, place to click well, but that we it was he was on there you go um it's nice to have buttons um does that help? I, I mean, I really don't know if that's the same John okay. Mark, because that John Mark does kind of run off into the darkness one time, right? And uh, I've heard him call the, the boy that was caught with just wrapped with a sheet in the garden yeah. of the yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Just <laughs> happy to know that there's always one in some in every church group. Um, who else has a question? Uh, Catherine. Well, I, I just have a comment that the thing that struck me is Jesus called a crowd. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that many passages are a crowd gathers around Jesus. So yeah. right there, this for the first time, I've thought about that, that Jesus mm -hmm. is actively calling mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's just one thing that, that struck me this time. Yeah. There seems to be a distinction in Jesus' early ministry to the things he says to the disciples and the things he teaches. Because, oh. you know, if you go to Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is early. It's in chapter five. So he's clearly teaching big groups of people. Mm -hmm. But there's like different things that he says to both. And mm -hmm. uh, just before this is that story where who do people say that I am? Okay. And Peter gets the right answer right before he gets called Satan. It's a rough yeah. day for Peter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, that is, it's just striking that he's, it's like he's talking to the disciples and then he says, no, this is for everybody. You, yep. The rest of you, you know, come on over here. Great to stop. <clears throat> I was thinking about the passage about um, there are those who will 
see the power of the kingdom, you know, before they taste death. And, and I wondered if it also just might include that there are people who just get it. Mm. It doesn't have to do with the transfiguration. It doesn't have to do with Pentecost. It has to do that there are people here who will get this. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's possible. It as I look at my Bible now, because I, I, I had my Bible on the screen. And so while I was looking at you, I couldn't see it. But then I got this one out. It is literally the next story. In the next verse, it's the transfiguration. So there's some, I mean, there's an, that, there's an elegance to that. But I think, yeah, some people got it. And he, he would say, you know, for those who have ears to hear, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the people who had ears to hear understood it. They made the connections between the prophecies and the Messiah who actually came, oh. which otherwise was a huge disappointment to a lot of people. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the power that that would make, in, as you were teaching us in the parables, of understanding what the kingdom of God was and, mm -hmm. and where you see it. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a parable. No, no, it's not a parable, but it's, yeah, but it's Jesus' favorite topic, which you'll never, hopefully you'll never get tired of hearing me say that. This is Jesus' favorite topic. And all of us have friends who have favorite topics. They could be baseball, it could be history, it could be music. Yeah. When Jesus got 40 days to spend with his disciples after the resurrection, he spent it talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, well, I like your, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can okay. now. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, I like your uh, suggestion that it may refer to Pentecost. Because, I mean, obviously, the Very biggest Tom view. Now what's happened? Go it's ahead, big, Jack. Well, the biggest problem is the idea that it was the second coming, and, and he misunderstood. But that, you've got to think what happened in the next 30 years. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and, 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 and the Gospel of Matthew was written either 65 or 70, like you say. And uh, so all those things were happening. The church was growing like mad. And so yeah. there were some standing there who would see that power. Mm -hmm. I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a good, uh, but I think your idea of the, of the suggestion it might be Pentecost itself uh, is a good, good one. But some people mistake that Pentecost as being the second coming, C.H. Dodd and others. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, who else got a comment or a question? Um, John, I yeah, this uh, that reference in um, uh, the verse thirty nine that a lot of people think of as <coughs> the second coming. Mm -hmm. uh, um or the end of days, that continues to be a problem, does it not? Well, in, yeah. in, uh, the, in the theology of the, the, the new church? You mean that, that people misunderstand this, po this passage or the whole idea of the second coming? That, that people miss, well, not just this passage, but misunderstand, um, you know, when when that second coming will be yeah um you know uh, that sort of thing yeah i mean is it, isn't yeah. that the one of the reasons why you know th this this particular passage and others like it um you know uh, are are still i guess uh not still but uh, were particularly in the time of the early church a problem yeah, I think people assumed that Jesus' return would be quick. Yeah. It was not. And so that's uh, that's been a problem for the church to talk about for a long time. And um, if you look at uh, Matthew 24, where Jesus says, preach the gospel to all the nations and then shall the Lord come. So some people understand yeah. it as, you know, once, once we've shared the gospel everywhere, 
uh, then Jesus will come back. But but we get into, we trip ourselves up when we're looking at, when we're trying to figure out what Jesus calls the day and the hour, right? Uh-huh. And uh, he said even he didn't know. And and folks, if Jesus didn't know, it's okay that we don't know. <coughs> and uh, whatever that looks like. But I will also say, for those of you who have become elders or deacons, y- and, and I think even, I'm trying to remember now the questions for membership, we, we all agree to at least wrestle with the hope of the promise that Jesus is coming back. It is a part of our, this is not some fringy doctrine out there that other people believe. This is, this is the source of our hope, that Christ will come to complete the the process that was begun in the garden and continued through abraham and the prophets and and uh and on through christ and through the church and so uh you know maybe i should have told you to read the fine print before you took your vows but it's uh it's this is in there it's but it's not the sandwich board jesus is coming again and boy is he blanked you know boy is he angry uh or you know, this is uh, our sense of hope in Christ coming back is that it is the completion of things, not the end of things. And so, mm-hmm. as I said a couple times during Advent, there's a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism just wants things to get better. Hope believes things will be fulfilled or completed. And we believe, collectively, <coughs> even, even when it's hard, <coughs> Christ will come back and complete this part of our history. And, uh, and I have no idea what that'll be like. You know why? Because nobody really has any idea what, that, what, that'll be, what that'll be like. And people can quote the day and the hour passage, but they sure spend a lot of time trying to figure out the month and the week. <laughs> He's so good. <laughs> so... I'm I'm really still struck by the two crosses thing, and I, I'll prattle on about that in a minute. But <laughs> Luann? well, I'm just thinking that those days were really tough, and I, I'm thinking that these days are tough, and I don't think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing about it. Hmm. I just wonder if anybody hmm. else feels like that. I feel like that's why that very part of the scripture where we're supposed to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow Jesus. I don't think we're very good at that. Mm. Um, and it, and it, it's hard. And so sometimes we don't want to do hard things. Um, well, I wonder what it means right now. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think it means that we need to be, um, and this is just for me, I'm not, calling anybody out i just think we need to be better about uh because i think we all know what god is calling us to do or jesus is calling us to do but we don't follow through with that like it gets hard and we quit or hide or something i was just sitting here thinking about like Catherine said he now he called a crowd so it's not like the disciples were 100 percent ready to take over for jesus but he called the crowd anyway, and he wanted to teach them and give the disciples even more people to um, speak with. I think we're called to do that also. Like we're mm-hmm. not perfect and we don't have all the answers, but I think us individually and us as a church, we could be better about um, sharing that our faith with people and inviting people and like John likes to tease me for saying we shouldn't be fancier than we are, but I think we get stuck on that. Like we have to be all perfect before we can really open up or whatever, but we don't. And it's mm. actually better really if we aren't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's hard to take up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tim. Well, <clears throat> and I agree with, with Jen. It's, it would have been so easy the crowd to be this you know have jesus say everything is going to be cool it's going to be easy i'm bringing you peace and he's saying 
it's going to be hard. It's going to be, you're going to have, you know, you're going to be challenged and it's, mm -hmm. and um, so it was a kind of a, kind of a, a warning shot and a, and, a, and a challenge for, you know, it's believers to say, there's going to be some, some tough times ahead and some work, but this is what I'm asking you to do. And I, I, so the flip side would be, you know, okay, everybody, <laughs> here we go. We're all going to go up to the kingdom. Uh, uh. And, yeah. and I think yeah. he's, he's telling the crowd and his disciples, Hey, things are, are going to, you know, it's going to be tough and it's going to get tougher. And, the crucifixion is a great example of, you know, yeah. this, this is, this is what you might have to face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just, it brings, Tim, what you just said brings two things to mind. One is that it would have been, I, I think a first century person living under the thumb of the Roman empire would think it was bizarre beyond words that we wear crosses as jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and so, you know, not for nothing. That's just kind of a throwaway line. But I, I think I, I, I think we and I get why, because there's a you know, it is it's it's the um, it's the wonderful cross. Right. I mean, we we associate a meaning with it. But but 2000 years ago, they would have it would be it's not enough to say it's like the electric chair. It, it's, you know, if you could figure out some way to draw and quarter somebody and make jewelry out of it, that's what it's more like. And so it's, it, it's a, um, I, I just think that, you know, that's just an observation of how we've, uh, of, of how that image has evolved over time. But the other thing that I think is more, is more important for us as we think about what this means for us is that comfort is all can always be the death of faith uh -huh. because when we're comfortable it's easy to forget that we need that we need a savior it's easy to forget that we that we have a calling on our life. when we're comfortable i think comfort's a killer and because comfort can go a bunch of ways it can go just through sort of personal possessions and personal comfort but it it can also, and I think we're seeing this not with real evangelicals, but I think we're seeing this, as we talked about in the class in the fall, with the people who have associated the Christian faith with somehow with patriotism. And so then they become one and the same. And, you know, yeah, this is a powerful country. It's a huge economic engine. Uh, a lot of people are comfortable, not enough, but a lot of people here are comfortable. And it's easy to get, it's easy to say, well, yeah, my life's pretty good. But the daily awareness of the need of a connection with God through Christ, that's tough to find when we're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think something of taking up that cross and on a, in a more intentional, disciplined way is what we're called to do. And I don't know how to do that. I think that might be an individual thing. But I think uh, as a community, uh, I just read something uh, today, oddly enough, I think maybe it was about this passage. Oh, it was in another source, and I don't want to flip through pages now. But this guy was leading, uh, uh, was a leader in the sanctuary movement in the, in the 80s. Now, the sanctuary movement right, brought people uh, from countries where there were war and, and basically hid them in churches. And somebody said, I really want to join your movement. And the, and the priest said, great, but here's what I, I want you to answer these questions. Are, are you willing to lose friends? Are you willing maybe to lose your job? Are you willing to have your children teased at school? Are you willing to suffer pain yourself from people who don't like what you do? And the person walked away. I don't blame them, first off, for walking away. But I think that's a little bit of what it looks like it, to take on the unpopular stance when it when it's truer to the gospel than the popular stance is. And I think that's uh, that's probably a practical way to think about what it means to take up our cross. Thank God nobody's getting crucified in our neighborhood. 
but there are all kinds of ways that the faith gets crucified. And maybe that's what we're called to be aware of and to resist in a meaningful way. How do we resolve this when he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and I come that you might have life and have it abundantly? Yeah, well, I, I get that you're, you're uh, I, I like that you're bringing up the passages that sound like they're contradictory to these, but aren't. Uh -huh. Because remember, Jesus in all of his teaching is taking the eternal view. And so he might say, you might suffer for a while here. But in my father's house, there are many mansions. You know what I mean? It, he's, his perspective goes beyond the end of our finite lives. Now, I get that that's hard. I, I'm not saying that's easy for us to, to believe or know or even trust. But that's, that's why Jesus can say both of these things. Take up your cross and my burden is light. Because his the burden we take on Christ's behalf has, in his teaching, eternal consequences, eternal blessings to it. He's carrying the heavy load. Well, he is, yeah. And, you know, that doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. But, I mean, the, the list of martyrs uh, over, over the centuries is long. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus would say, I think, without ever dimish, diminishing that suffering, I think Jesus would say uh, the, the, the eternal uh, payoff, to, to, to use a commercial word just like Jesus does in this passage, the eternal dividend makes the suffering worth it, and by comparison makes it light. Yeah, Paul says the same thing. Yeah. Dale. I think I saw Ray with a question. I think it was Dale. Oh, was, sorry, Dale. Dale. <laughs> I look a lot like Ray. Uh, <laughs> here you do. He's a very good looking guy. <laughs> There's another juxtaposition within this reading that's interesting that uh, take up your cross and you've got to be willing to lose your life. And uh, some of you are going to see the kingdom of God coming. I wondered if that is a, a reassurance that uh, take up your cross, but it's, it'll, it'll get better soon. Or take up your cross, so you better get on the ball uh, before things get down to uh, getting serious. I think Jesus says a lot of those things that are probably both, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, I, I, I think this passage is one where he's reminding them that being a follower of Christ might bring some suffering to it. But he's also saying, as as was pointed out, that that the eternal um result of that faithfulness is will will make the suffering light by comparison but john couldn't it also be that that once you get involved in the work of the kingdom that what seemed difficult in the beginning becomes not so hard because of what you're involved in i i think for for the people who get involved and, and are committed and really uh, give their lives in a, in a meaningful way to furthering the kingdom, I, I, think, I think they can see it that way, but it doesn't diminish their human suffering. Yeah. You know, as I think about, uh, I was just talking about mo modern martyrs, uh, uh, Oscar Romero, who I quoted in a, um, I think in something or other, maybe in a sermon or in a midweek reflection during Advent, that you can't really experience Christmas until you realize you're poor. And realizing you're poor, uh, in other words, realizing that you have desperate need is harder when you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, a, that's a tough read for us. We live in a comfortable place. And, and certainly relatively comfortable to the rest of the world. Um, and uh, and that, makes, that makes it all the, all the harder, I think, for us to, to recognize and to live into the need that we have uh, for Christ. Doesn't mean the need wasn't there. It just means it's harder to see when I've got eight Apple products here in my house that make my life interesting and easy. And I've got, uh, you know, uh, the 
possessions get in the way of that, financial comfort gets in the way of that. Sometimes, and this will this will kill the Dobson crowd, but sometimes even having a happy family uh, gets in the way of us recognizing that we have a, the need of a savior. And so I think those are, I think that we, we have a challenge ahead of us and it's a lifelong challenge that, that God blesses, right? Even in its difficulty, there's no expectation that we're going to get this perfect. There is a heavy expectation that we're going to be faithful to the process. And I think that's what he's saying when he says, take up your cross. Catherine, Betty's got it. John, I just keep yeah. thinking about the, how do you think the prosperity preachers deal with this? I'm not I sure do. I understand that whole gospel, that whole way of looking at Christianity, but it seems to me that they say, you know, believe in Jesus and you're going to be rich and you're going to this, 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 this. I, I don't yeah. know. I yeah. just, I've been wondering about that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's an easy target because they're so uh, blatantly and catastrophically wrong. <laughs> right now I have the mic, so I'm going to say what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> but it's, but we all do it a little bit when we reduce uh, Christian discipleship to magic. And that's what I mean is, well, if we just pray hard enough, this will happen. Where at somehow, if I just say the right words, this will happen. Prayer is meant to tap us into the stream of what God is doing. And occasionally, as we see examples of it in the Bible, occasionally, I mean occasionally, something we pray changes what God is going to do. But overwhelmingly, it's us conforming ourselves to the stream of what God's doing and not the other way around. Abraham had a special privilege, right? He, he got to say, well, if there's 30 righteous people in that town, would you still destroy it? And then he's haggling with God. But uh, I defy you to find five more stories like that in the Bible because there aren't. And so mostly our prayer is not, we think of it sometimes maybe too much as magic. For those of you who read the Frank Peretti novels in the eighties, that was faith as magic. If we just prayed hard enough, we'll win this spiritual battle. And if there are enough people who cover this thing with prayer, then this will, well, the minute it's a potion or a conjuring, it's, it's more Harry Potter than gospel. And so it's uh, that, that I think that I think that's a tricky thing. And certainly the prosperity gospel is the is the cartoonish, obvious example of that. If you believe if you have faith, you'll get rich. Well, what? a I almost said a word that would have gotten me fired. Um, <laughs> uh, but a lot of people, a lot of people are brought in. Sure. Um, yeah, but then a lot of people play the lottery too, you know, I mean, and I'm no, and no judge on the lottery because every time the, uh, the amount gets big, I'll say, okay, I'm going to buy a ticket. Or I'm one of those people who says, if I won the lottery, I'd do this. And then someone uh, says, well, do you play the lottery? And I say, well, no, <laughs> you can't really win it if you don't play it. Are you on that? Hi, mom. Hi. Um, Sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I thought it was a. No, it's okay. Uh, so we're, we're to we're to 10 after eight and I want to be faithful uh, to our time, but that's a great discussion of passage. And so thank you for that. Thanks, Jen, uh, for, thanks for giving me a new thing to think about in this passage that I've read a thousand times. Um, let me close us in prayer. God, thank you for uh, the ways that you shape us, for the things that you teach us, and uh, for the, the life that you call us to. Uh, make us into people who are uh, faithful disciples of you. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. God bless. Thanks, Jen.